I was born in Florida, in Ocala. I grew up in a small town north of Ocala called Martin, Florida. It's a small rural farming community. I feel like I am a country boy at heart. I'm the youngest of three kids. My father, Alberta, Benjamin Brown were mathematics teachers. That gave us a lot of impetus to study math and science. My mother used to always tell me, she said, you know, you're doing well, but you know, you really haven't been tested. You know, she would, you know, keep my feet on the ground, you know, let's just say, so I wouldn't get too impressed with myself. My mother came out with this brochure. She said, would you like to go to summer school at Exeter? And so I said, yeah, sure, why not? I came to the Northeast when I was probably about 15 or 16 or so, and I've basically been here ever since. I had decided to do medicine, and I decided to do my PhD in statistics. That was a rather avant-garde idea at the time. Data science is a big issue now, but if you go back you know, 40 years, that wasn't necessarily the case. And then during my third year in medical school, I really fell in love with anesthesiology. And I really wasn't trying to think of how I would mesh statistics with anesthesiology. The more I worked on problems in computational neuroscience, developing statistical techniques to analyze the data, I would run into people and they would say, oh, you know, yeah, that talk you gave on your methods was interesting, you know, we enjoyed it a lot. I hear you're an anesthesiologist, you know, how does anesthesia work? And I go, I have no idea. And, you know, I don't think there are any people who are more mechanistically driven than neuroscientists. And so to be telling neuroscientists, you do something regularly to patients and you have no idea how it works got to be a little embarrassing after a while. So I thought maybe I should work on this. I realized there were a lot of things that we were learning in our anesthesiology training that were just BS. There were reasons given for things which made no sense. Anesthesiology had developed this whole sort of what I'll call a legal fiction about how to think about like what was going on and people were very, very happy having it be like a black box phenomenon because if it's a black box phenomenon, you can say anything. No one's pinning you down. And it was even worse than that. It's not that it's unknown. It was perceived as so complex that it was unknowable. And then the more I applied the neuroscience paradigms, like, wow, I can draw circuits. These are very robust behaviors. Moreover, the signals are very, very strong. Every time we give an anesthetic drug, the brain oscillates. Maybe those oscillations are related to how the drugs are working. My God, that's it. That's what's happening. You give the drugs, they take over the circuits, they drive the circuits to oscillate. You change the drug, you get a different set of oscillations. It all started to come together, not just in a basic science sense, but also in a clinical sense. It jived perfectly with what I saw in the operating room. The idea that you can do something and then the patients are better off because of what you did, nothing could be better. There's no cooler feeling. And you can walk in the room and say, you know, Mr. So-and-so, I'm going to take very good care of you. You could not be in better hands. We're going to make sure that you're perfectly unconscious during the procedure, you're not going to feel any pain, and we'll wake you up on a dime, and you know, you'll be quite comfortable afterwards. That's the objective. So until you're able to do that with every patient, there's a lot of work to do.